Let's go over this one again because I think we missed something last time. It was right at the end of, the cl of class. He loved, where do we put the stress? Oh, we don't need stress here. What is this for? Whose is this, number 12? What do we need that there for? Is it supposed to be stress? Is it supposed to be a stress mark? Shema. Buyongla, right. First of all, it has only one syllable, right? Oh, I know what you mean. We don't need a stress mark, but it goes at the beginning of the word. This is for intonation. But anyway, if it were just for the word by itself, we wouldn't need a stress mark. But in the sentence, it has stress. So, he loved a, a what? Dull, muddy, Colored, and then R, how are we writing R? Upside down, rug. He loved a dull, muddy, muddy what? Should be? Long. Longy. Please remember that. I know that you're in the habit of writing it as a short E from KK, but now we're going to write it as a dotted long E. Muddy, colored, rug. All right, anybody notice anything that I missed? Is it okay? The only thing I would add that we're not, that Latifoga doesn't ask you to do is we put this here to show it's got tonic stress. This is our own addition. Actually, he has something like it later. It's not, it hasn't been talked about yet in the textbook, but we already know the meaning of this. He loved a dull, muddy colored rug. So just add it on. It doesn't count as wrong. But just get in the habit of putting a little asterisk by the word with tonic stress, or by the syllable with tonic stress. All right, the girl with curls has furs and pearls. Anybody notice anything? Let's put the brackets around it. We need stress. The girl with curls has furs and pearls. We need stress. Anybody notice anything else that I missed? 15 brackets. He howled out loud as the cow drowned. Make them vertical, tonic stress. Are we okay on this? Let me just check what we've got. Does that look okay? All right. And the boy was annoyed by boiled oysters. Looks okay to me. Anybody else notice anything? Tonic? Okay. Raise your hand right away if you see anything. Up here, it's really easy to miss things. So I'm relying on you to catch the things I miss. And for I, 14 is over. Yeah, OK. Thank you, thank you. I like with curls. Just a minute, let me look at it. It should be, I like what? Miles. 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 I like. Miles of bright lights. Stress, lights. Tonic. I like miles of bright lights. Are we okay? Now part I, right? Don't see it. Let's just put it on the board. For I, the first one, broad, 
please come home. Please come home. OK? Broad, what are we going to add for narrow? This is A. <coughs> this is B. He didn't number them, but let's give them numbers so we can find things. If you want to add a little extra that we didn't really mention much in class yet, you can put a little raised aspiration mark, small h. Please come. If it's the first voiceless stop of a word, it will usually have quite a bit of aspiration. So we can add the h if you want. So this has stress, but we really here we want, let's just put the tonic there. Okay, anybody have anything to add? Here we have the second one. He is going by train. And because it's a broad transcription, let's use slashes. So that's the convention. When you're doing a phonemic or a broad transcription, use slashes. If you're putting in more phonetic detail, more allophones, then use brackets. He is going by train train, mark the stresses. Here we need the stresses too. He, or it probably doesn't have a stress here. He is going by train. This is a tonic, let's just mark a tonic. He is going by train. Here we have something called velar raising. We're going to talk about it in a minute in class, velar raising. If a front vowel comes before a, a voiced velar sound, here's the rule. New rule. You need to know this. We're going to talk about it on the web page, but it'll be easier if you already know what it is. If a front vowel comes before a voiced velar sound, in many varieties of English, the vowel tends to be raised. So we don't say going. It's not going. I, I, for example, in sounds like I, but going, going. Some people actually do say that. I don't, and I'm guessing the majority don't. In front of a voiced velar sound, especially a voiced velar, well, voiced is understood, a velar nasal, the front vowels will be raised. So I sounds more like E, but it's not all the way to E. We don't say going. Going is weird. It's somewhere between I and E. And for a stop as well. And not everybody has this because a friend of mine who's from California, grew up in California, he really does say pig. But I don't say pig, I say pig. Can you hear the difference? So if I'm following the vowel strictly, it would be pig. And some people do say pig. But I say pig. It's not pig, and it's not pig, it's pig, pig. Can you hear that? It's a little higher. But it's not quite as high as ing, going, going pig. And you can hear it a little more clearly if I compare similar words. This is the word ping, which is really a nisang zi, it's onomatopoeia. This is just pig, this is ping. So, pig. Ping. And let's compare. Let's compare a friend vowel coming before a voiceless stop. That's pick. Pick, pig, ping. Can you hear that vowel getting higher and higher? Let's go backwards. Ping, pig, pick. Pick, pig. You can see it in my mouth. Pick, pig, ping. Is it getting tighter and more spread? Ping, pig, pick. Mamingxian, right? I'm sure a lot of you have noticed before. I know that my students kind of look at me when I tell them how to pronounce a word, and it doesn't sound quite like i. And there's a reason for it. Is there a contrast between pig and pig? 
Is there a word pig competing with pig? For example, there's beat and bit, right? If you change the vowel, you get a totally different word, right? So, pit, peat, or bit, beat, dung dung. With T, we don't have that problem. But with G, do we have uh, uh, between the two? No, that wasn't a good example. So, bid, bead, there we go. Let's find a voiced one. Bid, bead, bid, bead. There we have a good example. Those are two totally different words, right? But how about pig, pig? No. And not only for pig, but for many words that end with ig, there is no contrast between it and e. So in front of g, we very seldom have a contrast, a competition between it and e. And when there's no competition, what happens? What tends to happen? It's sort of like if you're on a bus and someone's sitting here, are you going to sit right close to that person? What do you usually do? You go further away, put some space in between you because you've got space. If there's nobody on the bus, where will you sit? Wherever you want. You may sit way at the front and then listen to the siji, you know, and talk with him or something. Or you may sit in the middle, you may sit in the back. You can sit wherever you want. If there's no competition, nobody else is taking up that space, you will sit wherever you want. But if someone else has already occupied one space, you will probably, if they're in the back, you'll probably sit more in the front. Well, vowels do the same thing. So between bid and bead, they stay in their own places because if e starts going towards i, it will sound like i. And then the two sounds are not distinct. The two words will not be distinct. But if there is no contrast between pig and pig, no contrast, what do you think the i is going to do? Jerome? It won't be so yenjin, right? It will do whatever it wants. It's probably not going to go all the way to e because it takes too much effort. But it also takes effort to stay focused on one little spot. So when nobody's around watching, aren't you a little bit less careful about what you do? Right? When nobody's watching and nobody is competing with you, then you can just kind of do what you want. You can sit where you want. You can do what you want. And that's what it does. So it is a little looser here. It goes a little more towards e. Before ng, there is zero contrast. Before ig, occasionally there is a contrast between i and e. It's not common. For example, we have ligature. Ligature means lian xi, lian zai qi. And we have the word league. So these are two sounds, two, two, uh, two different vowels in front of g, ligature. And is this long or short? It's long. So in front of this G, we do have a contrast occasionally, but not often. Ligature, league. Everybody try ligature. ligature. League. league. Look at my mouth. Ligature, league. We've got two different vowels. We've got an I and an E, right? But usually in front of G, there's no competition. So that means if it's supposed to be an I, it will start sitting where it wants to. It goes more towards E. So pig, pig, li, a pick, but pig. Pick, pig, pick, pig. And with NG, there is zero competition. The vowel that comes before NG will never contrast with a long version of the vowel. So there is no, absolutely no difference between ping and ping. Never. It never happens with NG. This is an important point. It will probably be in a test. So make sure you understand it. It will be on the web page, but it's good to put it in your notes and think about it carefully. Before NG, long and short differences in vowels are neutralized. So therefore, we have pick, pig, ping. That's the highest one. I call it velar raising. It's been noted in the literature here and there, but it's not often mentioned. But for me, it's really obvious to my ears. Not everybody has this one, but most people have this one. Okay? So background on that. 
That's why we add this little, it looks like a capital T turned upside down. Whenever we have velar raising of a vowel, the vowel is a little higher than normal, then we can put that mark under it, which means raise the vowel a bit. If you turn the T back right side up, that means you what with the tongue? If an upside down T means raise the tongue, then a right side up capital T means lower the tongue. So if the tongue is lower than usual, then write a capital T. It's not really a T, it just looks like one. So if we want to add a little more detail here, he is going, this, what's a going? Going by train. Okay? If we really train, if we really wanted to add more train, that's got quite a bit of aspiration, but we didn't really ask for that. All right, the tenth American, the tenth, uh, what is this symbol? Who wrote this? To say the, okay, what should you put here? What should it be? This is a plain letter E, but it should be, Alex? A backwards three we call epsilon, epsilon. And let's turn the R upside down. American, the tenth American. And here the, where do we put the dental sign? Under the vowel? Ten, te, our tongue isn't touching anything for the vowel, right? We put it under the, under the N. The tenth, if you want to add more detail, you can add aspiration. The tenth, uh, again, American. We don't need to add aspiration here because if it's not the first syllable, we usually don't aspirate it as much. Did everybody hear that? I'm going to say one more thing about it, so make sure you understood that part. So American. I do have aspiration, but not as much as for key. Key, I have a lot of aspiration, but American. <laughs> American. I have some, not quite as much. Because it's less, I'm not going to put the H there. Now, they seem to know it in the Taiwan teacher training system. There's one word where it turns up really often, but this is the word. How do you say it? A lot of you say stupid, stupid, too much B. Too much B. A lot of people say stupid, stupid, or stupid, stupid. We don't, we don't take away that much aspiration. Stupid. It's still stupid. It's still So don't say stupid, stupid. That's very Taiwanese. stupid. Everyone's stupid. Stupid. Okay, don't say stupid. Stupid, okay, how oh, stupid. Mm. American. Zhixian, make your stress mark straight. We're not marking secondary stress. We're, we're going to talk about secondary stress in a later chapter. But for now, the tenth, we need stress here. Okay? Anybody catch anything I missed? His, what's, what's the, um, What's the vowel here? For American, it's what? Ah, for British, it's upside down, knowledge. Uh -huh. And I, I wrote down a schwa here, knowledge is possible. Knowledge is what I heard in Bruce's recording, I think, of the truth. His knowledge of the truth. And for more detail, his knowledge of the, I don't have much difference here except for truth. We can have aspiration and voicelessness. Can anybody notice anything else? His knowledge of the truth. If not, let's keep going. I prefer, we still don't have that? Okay. 
I prefer is what I heard. You can say prefer, but here they said prefer. That's more common. Sugar. Un. Cream. Actually, that's tonic. I prefer sugar and cream. This is what I heard. Anybody have anything different? I uh, prefer sugar and sugar and cream. Aspiration, voicelessness. Okay, anything else? Yeah. Um, should, shouldn't the vowel of be the Yes, it should. Mm -hmm. I've got it in my notes here. Thank you. That's what you meant. Thank you. That's right. Anything else? Anybody find anything else? Yeah, I wrote it there, but I just didn't write it on the board. Thank you. The last one, Sarah took pity on the young children. For A, we want a broader transcription. Sarah took pity on the young children. Upside down R. That looks okay to me. I'm not doing the British now. It's getting to be a little too much. American is actually good enough for us. We'll do more with British when we have time. Remember to make your stress marks straight. 直的,不要弯的,或者斜的. This is a tonic. Sarah took pity, aspiration, tap on the, might have a dentalized N here, on the young children. Okay? Anything else? That's it. We're marked now. We've finished marking. We're going to read the next passage. Each person gets one sentence. So, Mendy, you ready? So, we're going to read the sentences. Each person gets one line. And the first one is going to be read with a British accent. So, just follow what they have here. And maybe you practice with the CD, I hope, and see how you do. Okay. Go. Wendy. Mm -hmm. It is possible to transcribe phonetically. Pretty good. It is possible to transcribe Phonetically, transcribe phonetically. All right, next. Any utterance in any language. That sounded really American. Can you make it a bit more British? The symbol's the same, which makes it hard to know what to fix. Remember the wedge? It's more like ah in British. Any utterance in any language. Not bad, okay. Any utterance in any language. And he does definitely a language, I do language. Next. Phrase in several different ways. Okay, that sounded pretty good. In several different ways. In several different ways. Next. Samantha. All of them using the alphabet and conventions. What's the third word? Them. 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 And also the first word. In American, it's all. In British, it's more like Taiwan English. All of them using the alphabet and and. Conventions. Next. Zoe? Zoe. Of the IPA. Good enough. It also sounds American, but they're pretty close. Of the IPA. Next. Uh, the same thing is possible. The same thing is possible. Mm -hmm. Next. With most of the international phonetic alphabet. It makes me feel good that your American English sounds so good. It's hard to go to British, and mine is not that good. But at least it sounds good as American English. All right, with most, most, uh huh, other, what? International phonetic alphabets. Can you try it again? With, with most, with most, most, mo most, not most. It's o. With, with most, mo mo mm -hmm. most, most, other. Out the 
Oh, uh, inter international international phonetic alphabet. That's good enough. Okay, let's go on. A transcription which is made by using letters of the simplest possible shapes. Okay, the two most different words sounded the most British, which is something. Letters sounded British and possible. So a transcription which is made by using letters of the simplest possible shapes. Okay, it's not that good, but okay, let's move on. And the simplest possible uh, number. Uh, and then, yeah. Uh, That's fine. Is called. Uh, 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 the first one is uh, and. Repeat it. Oh, and in the it's simplest. It's not and. And, uh -huh. and in the simplest possible number. Pretty good. And, and in the simplest possible number. And? Is called. Is called. Uh, is called. called uh -huh. A simple phonemic. Phonemic? Phonemic uh -huh. transcription. Okay, they all sound really American, but mine is not much better, so I can't be too picky. So it's called a simple phon phonemic transcription. All right, American, next. Wendy, if the number of different letters, letters is more than the minimum. Good, next. Mm -hmm. As defined above. Good. The transcription will not be a phonemic Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but an allophonic one. Good. Next. Some of the phon phonemes. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, we're too same. American now. <laughs> <laughs> we're not American now. Some of the phonemes, mm -hmm. that is to say. Good. It still sounded British, but that's okay. That'll make up for some of the other ones that were supposed to be British and sounded American. Go ahead. Will be represented by more than one different symbol. By more what? More, more than. 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 And watch the end. The first time I think you dropped an N. Try it again. Will. Will by. Oh, will be represented by more than one different symbol. Good. Symbol. Symbol. All right. I always have a vowel there. Symbol. I always have a vowel. Here he claims there is none. But from Americans, generally, there will be a schwa there. Bull. Between the B and the L. Americans will generally have a schwa there. Brits, not always. Brits often don't. And will be. It says be here, but be is not American. Will be. Normally we say be. Let's go on. In other words, some words. words. See the D and Z. Mark that or put it in your notes because in Taiwan English, it usually is a simple Z. Words, words. But it should be words. Remember, zi means the zi. Word means zi, so it's easy to remember. Words. Words. Try it again. In other words, some. In other, not in other. In other. In other words. The D, it's not a D, I'm sorry, it's a the. Try it again. Uh, in other. In other. In other. There we go. Words. Mm -hmm. Some elephant of some phonemes. Good. Phonemes? Mm hmm. Next. Will be singled out for representation in the transcription. Good. One more. Hence the term allophonic. Hence the term allophonic. All right, we made it. Next is performance exercises. I want you just to read them to me as a class, starting with the first one. Read them slowly and read them carefully. Okay, I hope that you practiced a bit at home, just very carefully. Let's say, everyone, ah, together. Continue. Mm -hmm. Is ah, uh, that's not an e there, it's an i. Good. Mm-hmm. Good. Mm-hmm. Good. Very good. B, go on. And just read them slowly, carefully, in order. Starting from the first one. Good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Very nice. Let's uh, go on to C. Go down each column, starting at the top. Go. Tafed. Go on. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That was absolutely wonderful. That was really good. Let's do the second column. Go. Key peak. 
Keep one. Good. Oh, don't put the stress on the second syllable. Keep the stress on the first syllable. Again, the second one. Uh huh. You know, it's a very natural thing to move the stress to the second syllable. Actually, you, that's a really good instinct. Why? It's not what we want here, but it's a good instinct. Why? Because which part is different? Oh, no, in this case, it's not. In this case, it's not. In another case, it would be. I'm sorry. But if the difference was in the second syllable, we would stress it to show that that's where the contrast is. But here, so start again from the top. Go. Key peak. Continue? Good. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Third column. Good. Lamb. Lamb man. Don't put, a, don't put a schwa in there. We're not using schwas here. Just read what we have. The second one, go. Lamb. Good. Lamb. Ma'am. Land nam, sorry. Land nam. Good. Land nan. Land nan. Good. Land All right. Land nan. Now, we don't necessarily have velar raising here. What I showed you with it applies to the other friend vowels, including what? E and a. Velar raising applies to i, e, and a. We'll find some examples since we're talking about it now. After the exercises, we'll go to the web page and look at the examples. You probably have looked at them on your own if you've worked through the web page. But here it doesn't say we have velar raising. Not every variety of English has it, certainly not every language has it. So land noun would be more, uh, more precise, more, more correct. And the last column, please. Malo, Malo. good. Malo. Good. Malo. Good. Malo. Good. Malo. Good. Malo. Good. Malo. Very good. And then D is taken care of for us. And then we just have a few more nonsense words to read through. And we're done with the performance exercises. So the first one in E, go. Scum Good. Scum zeal. Good. Good. Bride blues. Good. Bride blues. Bride blues. Good. Next. Jinx mang. And I noticed that Peter put a Put an epithetic K in there. Tada K, yo maltulai. And jigen S to jin. He said, as I remember, jinx man. Jinx, tayoga K, paltulai. Just like in strength in English. Next one. Good. Do it again. Floish thrives. Thrives, yao tu shethou, because of the the. Once more. Thrives. Good. And? Pute page. That sounds kind of disgusting. I guess it sounds like puke. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're done. And the rest of it I hope you've read. We're not going to do this kind of thing now, but you need to practice to get good at this. My personal priority, though, is that we get good at American English. I'll mention British here and there. I'm limited because my British is... I've had training, but I'm not good enough. Um, I just want you to get really good at American English. If you're really good at American English, you will have trained yourself to be sensitive to any sound, basically. And after that, it'll be easier for you to imitate any sound. That takes care of that part of chapter two. We're going to go to the web page quickly. OK, I asked you to read it yourself. But I want to perform a few things so you can actually hear them. We already covered the very top part of page 15 when we were talking about the concepts of phonemes and allophones. And some of you thought that that was kind of a fun comparison or analogy, that the phoneme is you and allophones are different expressions of you depending on who you're talking to, right? Everyone remembers that. We're going to go on now into uh, to some specific examples. We talked on the previous page about some of the different allophones of L. Well, I suppose that, okay, these are different allophones of L. We talked about them before in class. 
If it's at the beginning of a syllable before a vowel, we have what is called a what kind of L? A clear L. And we also have a clear L in front of a vowel. If it's got a voiceless obstruent in front of it, it's probably going to be voiceless. And if it comes after a vowel, it is usually a dark L or velarized L. And we said it so sounds something like an exaggerated Beijing pronunciation of uh. It's the back of your tongue that becomes very tense and it gets close to your soft palate. That's why we call it a velarized L. The tip of your tongue doesn't always touch your alveolar ridge. And then we had some examples here where we have some dark L's and we have some L's that disappeared. Half, salmon, palm, almond. Now, half and salmon, they never have an L that's produced, or that's, sorry, that's pronounced. But palm almond can either be palm almond or palm almond. I tend to have something of a dark L. I have velarization. So palm almond, one of my teachers said that, but I say palm. Can you hear the L? I have velarization. It's not a really complete L, but I have, the back of my tongue is getting tense, so palm almond. And I discussed this with some some of my colleagues in pronunciation teaching, and they said, oh, don't teach that. That's not standard. Not many people say that. Now, I say it. So is it just me? No. That means since that day, I started paying close attention to speakers of American English. I can tell you that more than half the people that I listen to, just a rough estimate, it's impressionistic. But many, many people pronounce that L. You hear it all the time. If you listen to ICRT, you will hear it in some of the announcers. So palm almond. A lot of people have velarization for that L. But it's not palm almond, not Johan Shaw. That's about it. So those are all different allophones of L. And we talked about how if we don't devoice the L, sometimes we'll get an extra syllable. It'll sound like pale, because you want to make that L voiced. And in the process, we might produce an extra schwa, an extra vowel. And here I mentioned that German has, does German have a dark L? The one you dark L. If you can read fast. German does not have a dark L at all. So if you hear one, it's probably an American or a Russian speaking German. Licht, dill. Licht, everyone try Licht. Licht. It's light. Licht. Licht. Dill. Okay, once more. Licht, dill. Right. And lull and lull I played for you before. And I said that a lot of Americans have dark L's even before vowels. So I can make it clear if I try. Play. That's pretty clear. Play. Everyone play. But more common for me is play. Play. Can you hear it's a bit darker? Play, 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 play. Listen to the file. It's still me, but play, play, play. Ooh, wasn't even But actually, I darken a lot of my L's, no matter where they are. Before a vowel, they're less dark. After a vowel, they're very dark. All right. So that's that. Now back to fifteen. So we talked about different allophones of L. Here we're going to describe a different set of allophones, one that seems to be seldom mentioned in books. You may have noticed that the vowel in the English ing ending sounds more like e. So for example, going, it's not goem. Goem sounds really wrong. We don't say it that way. Even though the usual IPA symbol is used, uh, that is used is what? Is it a long e or a short i? A short i. Phonemically, it's probably correct at least for standard American English and RP. RP is received pronunciation. You should know that. RP, as well received pronunciation. That's one way of referring to standard British English. It's less commonly used now, you still hear it. My British teacher uses it all the time. Excuse me, all the time. So, going, it's not all the way to E, it's not I, it's somewhere in between. But we use the I. And I said, it's certainly the right phoneme, but I posted this on a discussion list, and someone from New Zealand said, New Zealand English, and they gave me a very convincing argument. So 
We can say that it is a good choice, but it's not necessarily the best choice for all dialects of English. New Zealand 可能比较适合用 e， 不适合用 it， according to this colleague. This phenomenon that we noticed in ing, rather than sounding like ing, it sounds like ing. This phenomenon is part of a larger regular pattern. The tongue height used to produce the short vowels, i, e, a is raised when any of these three sounds is followed by a voiced velar sound. That's the key to the rule, everybody. So put it in your notes, and we will. I will be asking you to mark this in your transcriptions in the future, because it is such a different vowel in my variety of English and in many people's variety of English. That we need to constantly show that we're aware of it and we're hearing it. The two voice velar sounds are g and ng. This raising or the raising seems to be a bit more pronounced before the velar nasal, velar nasal, sorry, than before the voiced velar stop. So we have more raising in front of g or ng. More more of an e sound in front of g or ng. Ng. Can you say ng? It sounded like ng. 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 Yeah. In Taiwanese, how do you say? 用筷子夹东西。Ng. Right. 就是那个音。The IPA symbol used to indicate raising of the tongue is a tiny inverted capital T added beneath the vowel in question. The reason for this raising is that there are no minimal pairs contrasting e and i before. Angma before ng. We never distinguish. There's no contrast. Never a contrast between ing and ng. Mayo. So we get something in between because that vowel thinks it can go wherever it wants. Doesn't have to be e. Doesn't have to be it. Those are two extremes. Takes too much energy. So it picks something in the middle that's comfortable. We do have a contrast before g in a very few cases. Not many. This is the one I just showed you on the board. That's why I had it ready, like ligature, which is short, and league, ligature, league. 真的是有个对比 And also intrigue. And note that ligature and intrigue; these are both from French. So, 其实这个 pattern 会打乱是外来语的关系 Even though English is really, really full of French, 还是外来语就对了 We say intrigue; it's long, but we say trigger. 反击 trigger is a short i. So everybody trigger, trigger. intrigue, intrigue. Ligature. ligature, league. league. Okay? okay, so we've got a contrast there, but I had to look really hard to find those two pairs of contrasts, and they're not like like um, um, like bead and、uh, bid and bead. Okay, 它是比较长的字是其中一个音节拿来比 It's just Not that easy to find them. There are not that many. So the absence of phonemic contrast in front of g is not complete. 有非常少数的一些反例，可是不多 This allophonic change does not happen with the voiceless voiceless velar stop k. K 是完全完全没有 velar raising 这回事 So if it's a voiceless velar stop, no velar raising. Okay, don't get that mixed up. And it doesn't happen with any other sound. 任何一个其他的一个子音前，没有这个现象，只有 g 一部分，然后呢 ，n 是绝对有。Like weak and wick, weak 礼拜 ，wick 是蜡烛心 ，reek 是很臭 ，rick is a guy's name. Note that there are no e words to form minimal pairs with wig and wing. Wig 没有 ，wig wig 没有。Wing 也没有 ，wing wing 没有，或者 rig 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 没有这回事 ，ring ring 也没有。大部分的字是 i 跟 e 根本不构成 contrast。Is it all clear? 可以吗 ？That's why. That's how we explain why we have this funny variation, this funny、um, alternation with the i phoneme. We think it's i. 为什么呢？因为它跟 e 没有竞争，所以它可以乱跑。Usually, when you find variation like this, that's the reason. Because when another one is not in contrast, it's very easy to do. And here are some of the、uh, examples And here are some of the examples collected for i, 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 i,
也是有一个 n 嘛在里面 pink， 因为 k 的关系 n 会变成 n 的音。Pick, pig, pin, ping, pink. Can you hear the variation? Okay. Let's try this one with e. Peck, peg. Peck, peg. In this case, we're working with epsilon e, and it's getting closer to a. 还没有到 a， but peck, peg, peck, peg. Let's try.、Uh, let's try that one first together. Peck, peg, peck. Peg. Peg. Here's a not peg. Listen, peg, 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 peg. Now, as I said, not everybody has this. My California friend did not know what I was talking about. He just had no idea what I was talking about. He sent me a sound file. Ha di chi me yo, ha n g yo, g ha me yo. All right, the next one. Lend links. Send strengths. It's the same thing, but let's listen. Lend lengths. Send strengths. Okay. Now it's a little too loud. Let's fix that. All right. Listen again. Peck, peg. And lend lengths. Send strengths. Go ahead. Lend lengths. Send strengths. Strengths. If you put the K in there, your pronunciation will be right on the right on the nose. Okay, so lend links, send strengths. Everyone. Lend links, send strengths. Good. This one is hard for Taiwan students. Get ready. Back, bag, ban, bang. We've practiced this before, haven't we? I'm going to close the other files so I don't keep opening the wrong ones. Listen. Back, bag, ban, bang. So back, bag, 有一点朝向 a, ban 就没有了 Back and ban 没有 Ban is that a velar nasal? Now it's alveolar nasal. 它完全没有这个现象，一点都没有 But bang 绝对有 It's not ban, it's bang. Some people do have ban, and I discussed this with my New York friend. New York 人好像没有这个现象，不是每个人都有。New York 人比较没有 He says bag, and bang. I'm not so sure. I'll have to ask him again. Let's listen. Back, bag, ban, bang. Can you try it? Back, bag, ban, bang. Bag. bag. Okay, and not bag. Not in my dialect. It's bag. You didn't a bag. bag. You're doing too much at. It's not wrong. It'll be fine in New York and other places, but I want you to try and get mine. See if you can wait. Tell me, Sha. Bag. That's pretty good. Bag. Listen again. Back. Bag. Ban. Bang. Go ahead. Bang. I have made a bang. I have made a mango. Bang. All right. Here's one with R. Let's listen. Rack, rag, ran, rang, rank. Go. Okay. Need a rag. We go. Then you need a rang. Too much. Rag. Rang. Rang. Not ring. Rang. More a. You men, that got a little too much a. Rang. Wait a minute. Okay, rang, rang. That's very good. Rank, rag. So good. Now it's very good. Try it again. Rack, rag, ran, rang, rank. Go. Whoops. This one. Ran. Listen again, and we'll try it again. Rack. Rag, ran, rang, rank. Go. Ran. Ran. Okay. Some of these create pronunciation problems for Taiwanese students. In addition to not noticing the higher vowel in words like these, they often substitute an alveolar nasal where there should be a velar nasal. For example, rang will often be pronounced ran. Rang, 很多人会念 ran. 
And bangs will be pronounced bands. And that's almost 100% of my students, almost 100%, until they're trained. After they're trained, maybe about 78% will get it right. And then the rest still have problems until they work on it. Everybody can learn it. I just worked on this on Monday in Yingting and in Dai Yingwen. And a whole bunch of people gathered around me during break to get extra tutoring in it. And after we were finished, everybody had it perfect. But it took a lot of training to learn how to say bangs instead of bands. How do you do? Everybody bangs. Bangs. Right now you sound good. And let's see. So, rang will be pronounced ran, bangs as bands, strength as though it were written strength, but some native people, uh, sorry, some native speakers do say strength. I hear it quite often. I say strength. Now, do you pronounce them with a velar nasal? Do you use a raised vowel? Now, here, I just want to finish it so we don't have to set it up after break. There seems to be this tendency because in Mandarin, front vowels similar to English, a and e, can only be followed by we already talked about it a bit in class when we were talking about allophones of a ah in Mandarin. Remember we had a ah and an and yin and ang. And they all sound quite different, at least some of them sound different. If it is, if there is an alveolar nasal after the vowel, it sounds like what? In Mandarin, safety is what? An, right, an. That's a more front A. It's a mid, middle to front A, or central to front A. An, an. And then, if we have a velar nasal, we have? All right, just say those two to remind yourself that the vowel is quite different depending on the final nasal. This one? And? All right, they're very different vowels, right? Although we are quite sure they belong to the same phony. Or alternatively, a final velar nasal conditions the occurrence of a back vowel before it. And final alveolar N of front vowel. So velar nasal, you get an ah. Alveolar nasal, you get a, an ah. If you're Chinese, are you following Mandarin instead of English allophonic rules when producing the words in the above paragraph? So you got bands and bangs, why some bu fun? Anyway, as like a front vowel, is that right? And bangs. So a front vowel in Mandarin needs to be matched with n, right? But in English, it doesn't have to be. Bands, bangs. It has a little bit It has a front vowel, bangs. Because the can be paired with a velar. Chinese is not good. Do you all see the connection there? I think that's the reason why when you want to say liu hai, almost everybody says bands instead of bangs. And then the way I used to train it is instead of saying ang zang, train yourself to say ang zang, ang zang. Everybody try ang zang. And don't say ang zang, it's ang. Homing, hai si yoga velar nasal. Ang zang. Some of you have an alveolar. Homing, the nigga bean, eating out ng. Ang. Jo ang zang the ang. Everybody ang. Ang. Okay. Ang zang. Mm -mm 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 -mm. No, 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 no. Again. A, ng, homie, and the ang, the ang, the homie. Ang. Ang. Ang, dang. Ang, dang. Not about half of you have it right. Practice that. Write it down in your notes. Try to say ang, dang with a very strange foreigner vowel. Ang. Zhong wen, the ang, dang. Huan ge mu yin nian. Because the homie and the bi yin, bu yao tong velar, huan dao el velar. It's really difficult. But after you can do that, then you will say bangs correctly if you try, instead of bands. So ang zang, I'm going to write it in my notes. We're going to practice that next class. So just a minute, ang zang. I know it sounds silly, but it works. These examples should give you some idea of the kind of allophonic variation that can occur in English and Mandarin, but that your teachers or textbook often don't tell you about. Get in the habit of really listening for sounds you may not have learned correctly at school. They may be part of the national ESL dialect of your area. That's what my British friend and I call it, a national ESL dialect. This is a country Okay, so that's your own dialect, your own 
，就是那个 bands 念作念作 bands， 那是其中一个例子。So and they may make you feel like you fit in when you're around people who speak like this. But you will notice that native speakers say some of these sounds differently. These are the ones you should really watch out for and imitate in your own speech. So if native speakers are saying it different from the way a lot of Taiwanese are learning it, start paying attention. Train your ear and then train your mouth to say it right. That's it for this web page. These two web pages. Anybody have any questions? You want to change to practice Ang Zhang. We're going to talk about it a little more next time to see if you're able to train yourself a bit. And we're going to take a break. A couple of corrections. Stanley pointed out that Tisal, which as a second language, should be Diaoyuan, and that's well taken. Diaoyuan Guoyu is usually what we use to refer to German, Spanish, French, etc. That's true. For me, it's all the same because it's all a second language. In English, it's the same, but I think it's good to distinguish it in Chinese. So thank you, Stanley, on that. And then another thing that I wasn't thinking of when we were marking allophones for our narrower transcription was the long vowels. So you can put the little triangles in. Normally, we just write a colon. So please would have a, a length mark after the I. And the other ones with arrows here. Knowledge ah is a long vowel. We could add a length mark. And truth. Is also a long vowel. You could put a length mark there. And were there any other corrections I forgot? Anybody have anything else to add before we continue? Someone just asked if the next test will include questions on writing Chinese and IPA. No, because we haven't practiced yet. I won't test you on stuff that we haven't covered in class. You have to practice it, just like we had to practice pinyin. But pinyin is a little easier. IPA will be. I think a little more challenging, but you can also master it quickly. It's also basically a mechanical kind of exercise. It involves choices, and I'm going to give you my choices. My choices are not necessarily the choices of everybody, and they're not necessarily the best, but they're the ones that work for me. So we will do that after the test on chapter two. Okay. So any questions before we proceed? We're starting now with chapter three, and we'll have some students read aloud. At some point, I may start summarizing in order to move a little faster. Although I don't always move faster than you. So, next reader. So we're on page fifty-six, chapter three. Say the number of the chapter and all of the titles and section headers, etc. Chapter three.、Mm -hmm. The consonants of English.、Okay. We will begin this chapter. Begin. 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 Be not big. Be. Begin. 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 The stops, 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 ah ah, stops, are illustrated in illustrated, illustrated. Everyone, illustrated, illustrated. Why is this? Are illustrated in the nonsense utterance, says utterances. Pa, 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 pa. These stops are said to be bilabial, 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 alveolar, and velar. But it is not just not 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 not, not、mm -hmm. just the different places on the roof of the mouth that distinguish these these sounds. They are equally characterized by the movements of the lips in different parts of the tongue. Okay, that's good. By the movements of the lips, lips.、Uh, by the movements of the lips in different parts of the tongue. Good. Look at the movie. On the CD, and note the rapid, rapid movements of the lips for the first consonant, of the tip of the tongue for the second, for the, the for the second,、okay. and of the back of the tongue for the third. We're not going to do it in class. We're going to save time. Do it on your own. Mark it in your notes. You've all got the CD. Please look at it on your own time, 
You can see it as close as you want and as many times as you want when you're doing it yourself. Let's go on. So everybody has that. They're saying that we have bilabial, alveolar, and velar stops, but the differences between these is not just the different places on the roof of the mouth that distinguish them. Let's go on. The second movie on the CD shows different manners of articulation, illustrating the consonants, the ns, in the nonsense words, hade, hane, hase. 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 Look at the movie and then go through it slowly. You can use the right arrow key. Which arrow key. Arrow key. Arrow key. Mm -hmm. Which is usually at the bottom right of the keyboard to step through one frame at a time. So if you want to slow it down, use your arrow keys. You can look at one picture, one frame at a time. The movie can be viewed as separate pictures rather than a movie that's streaming. In Hadeh, note now, at the left of the note picture, how. Oh, note how, at the left of the picture, the soft palette. Pause. Picture. Picture. picture uh -huh. The soft palette. Soft. The soft palette rises to form a village closure in the first few frames. Even before the tip of the tongue moves up to form a closure on the alveolar ridge. On the on the alveolar ridge. Alveolar ridge. Alveolar ridge. Right. So what are they telling you to do? At the left of the picture, the soft palate rises to form a velic closure in the first few frames, even before the tip of the tongue moves up to form a closure on the alveolar ridge. So, Right. We just, we get ready early. The, the um, soft palate will usually go up early so that we have, uh, in order to get ready for an oral sound. Go on. Conversely, in Hanan, note that the soft palate moves up before the tongue moves, but this time only slightly. The soft palate does not make a complete closure and thus allows air to escape through the nose after the tongue tip has made a closure on the alveolar ridge for mm. The third nonsense word in this movie, Hanan, has tongue and soft palate gestures very similar to those in Hadeh. Because? Why? Everybody following? Because it's the same place of articulation, that's right, and also it's different from Hane because it's not a nasal. So we're going to get ready for an oral sound really early by sealing off the nasal tract. But if it's a nasal sound coming, we will often open the oral tract, uh, sorry, the nasal tract early. The velic closure will open up, the soft palate will come down, and then air will be going out through the nose. So they're going to be nasalized. So, huh, in. we're going to nasalize it probably. It may, it may all be nasalized. We could denasalize it, but very often nasalization is going to spill over to the vowels on both sides, especially before a nasal. Nasalized. Okay, let's go on. The small differences in tongue shape are hard to see in this film. Even when you step through it one in step through it one frame at a time. But if you superimpose tracings of the articulators at the, the end midpoints, you will find that in the, the center of the tongue is slightly hollow. The location of the construction con constriction in the, is slightly behind that for us. All right, those are two things that distinguish the two sounds. Of course, one is a fricative and one is a, a voice stop. But in addition, for the s, what do we have in the tongue that's different? The tongue is slightly hollowed. And don't call it a ditch. In English, we can't call it a ditch. So we wouldn't call it a ditch. We can call it a hollow in the tongue, or um, what was the other things that I put on your, um, on your notes. We'll just say that there is a hollow. Um, we have a, a, a small hollow in the tongue. Okay, and 
also during the also also yeah during the the teeth are closer together and slightly more forward than during the, the okay so we didn't finish actually just now so one thing is the slight hollowing of the tongue another one is that the constriction in the is slightly ahead of or behind the s. Which one is more front? Which one is more front? S is more front. The is a little behind it. And then much of the sound of, um, let's see, the is behind the teeth. Okay, go ahead. Also during the s, the teeth are closer together and slightly more forward than during the d. So what are they talking about here? So which one? Is your mouth more open for? For the right. For si, your teeth are going to be closer together. And? Much of the sound of s is produced by a jet of air striking the edges of the teeth. This is worth knowing. So a lot of that noise, that sawin we get from s, the noise is produced by, it says, a jet of air, a pen yeah, striking the edges of the teeth. Let's go on. The rapidly moving airstream is formed by the narrow gap between the tongue and the alveolar ridge. These requirements of the sound may explain why the speaker has slightly different tongue and jaw positions for the ends. Alright, we're going to make it probably the closure is more closed for s so we can get that noisy sound, that noisy frication. That's good enough. Let's go on. Stop consonants. This is really important, but you're going to know a lot of this information already from what? Where did we already cover this information, a lot of it? Kind of look ahead. If it looks a little familiar, what does it remind you of? Where did we already learn some of this? Anybody? From where? From the first chapter, we covered some of it. How about the tutorials, anybody? Stop at stops, we learned some of it. Did you all do the tutorials? Does it look kind of familiar now? Okay, a lot of what you learned in the tutorials will just be repeated here. So that was one reason we did them. It should save us time here. Let's go. Stop consonants. Okay. Consider the difference between the words in the first column in table 3.1 and the corresponding words in the second column. In the second column. Second column. Okay. This opposition may be said. Opposition. Opposition okay. may be said to be between the set of voices stop consonants and the set of voiced stop consonants. Do we need to stress stop here? What are we going to stress? And voiceless because that's the contrast. A voiceless stop consonants and the set of? Voiceless stop consonants and the set of voiced stop consonants. Very good. But the difference is there really not just one of voicing during the voicing. Voicing yeah. during the consonant closure. As you can see by saying these words yourself. Saying these words. Saying these words yourself. Good. Most people have very little, very, very, very little voicing going on while the, while the lips are closed during either pi or by. Both stop, both stop consonants are essentially voiceless. But in pi, after the release of the lip closure, there is a, there is a moment of aspiration a period of period period of voicelessness after the stop articulation and between the start mm -hmm. of and and before the start and before the start of the voicing for the vowel. If you put your hand in front of your lips while saying pi, you can feel the burst of air that comes out during the period of period. period of voicelessness after the release of the stop. Okay, so instead of saying of, say of. Of. Right, and link. Period of. Periods of. Right, okay, I'm being picky. That was beautiful reading. It was really, really good reading. 
So the main difference in English between by and pi is usually not a difference of voicing and voicelessness. We talked about this in class before. Especially if it is the first word of an B kaitoda zi. Ruho is the first word of an utterance, right? If it's the first word of an utterance, we usually don't voice, voice stops. Instead of saying, remember, boy oh boy, we usually say boy oh boy. If it's the first word of an utterance, this is important. This is really, really important. So if, it, if you don't really remember it much from last time, um, work on it, try to make it clear in your mind this time. Boy oh boy. Boy is the first word in the utterance. Boy oh boy. I don't say boy oh boy. I could. It sounds kind of funny to me. We usually don't voice g when they're the first sound of an utterance. So if g is the first sound of a word, that's the first word of an utterance. We usually don't voice it. Instead of saying boy, we say boy. Instead of saying dog, we say dog. Instead of saying guy, we say guy. And that means that these three sounds are pretty much the same as in Mandarin. Which is the utterance, the diga in the hua. They sound just like bodega in Mandarin. And that's very, very confusing because the books don't explain that. They tell you that they're voiced, but when they're the first sound of an utterance, we usually don't voice them. We could, but we don't usually. That's what it's saying here. This is really, really important. So the main difference between for example, by and pi, the biggest difference isn't in voicing, but in the biggest difference between by and pi is not a difference in voicing, but a difference of aspiration, right. So by has no aspiration. It's not really voiced either, by. But pi is, of course, voiceless, but it has aspiration. That's what makes the biggest difference between by and pi in many situations. It's not voicing, it's aspiration. When you study phonology, as I've mentioned before, they often don't even mention aspiration. They only want to mention just enough features to distinguish the two, the minimum number of features to distinguish two, so two sounds. They believe that aspiration is redundant. Mentioning that it's aspirated is redundant. This is the voice. Why do you say that? Because voice and voiceless is already the Right? Everybody following me or not? Bai and pi, you have to attribute. You have to add these two words. One is a voice, one is a voiceless. You have to attribute these two words, right? Then why do you add some details? It's the so-called details. Bai and pi, pi has aspiration. Many phonological descriptions don't even mention aspiration. And many books teaching foreigners English don't mention much about aspiration. They will just tell you it's voiced and voiceless. That's what your experience was in school, right? So it's your experience.还有提到有声无声，没有提到说送呃说送气不送气，有没有哪个课本有有讲那个送气不送气？ No, 一个都没有。But that's the main difference. It's not voicing. The main difference is an aspiration, which is why, as I've mentioned before. Most people, many people at least for certain, find it very, very confusing because I don't hear voicing in boy. They tell me that boy is so different from ban and mandarin. I hear no difference at all. No difference. Why is, why is boy vo voiced and ban is not voiced? They sound the same. And they are the same because I'm not voicing boy. So this is really important and that's totally confusing. Most books, as far as I have seen, do not tell you about this and they leave us all confused. Um, let me just go on a little bit to save us some time, we're getting close. In a narrow transcription, aspiration may be indicated by a small raised H, we already know that. We've already used it in our narrow transcription, a small raised letter H for aspiration. Usually the first syllable of a word is more aspirated. Subsequent syllables, aspiration may not be so American. It has aspiration, because it may not, for example, come not be so. So, we could write pi, tai, and chi with a small little raised h to show aspiration. Um, for tai and chi, maybe you don't feel that burst of air as much, but for pi you can all feel it, okay? Just to follow the text, everybody say pi and put your hand in front of your mouth. Pi. Feel some hot air on your hand, right? 
Try it with Thai and Kai. I get it for both. Thai, Kai. It may not feel as strong because it's, it starts deeper inside your mouth. So um, we've got columns one and column two now. Columns one and two now. So in the first column, it's voiceless, but the big difference between one and two is we're looking at the columns at the bottom of 57. The biggest difference between the stops at the beginning of the words in those columns is aspiration, right? The amount of voicing in each of the stops, BDG, depends on the context in which it occurs. This is important, pay attention. I know I say this a lot, but it is. If they occur in the middle of a word or phrase in which a voice sound occurs on either side, then the stops will be voiced. So, bout, bout is yijen, like yijen being about an illness. But if we say about, listen very carefully now, so you can hear the difference. Listen carefully. Bout, bout, bout. Do you hear voicing? Bout, yo mao. We have voicing only at the beginning of the vowel. 直到那个vowel,那个点开始才有voicing. Vowel之前听不到 voicing. Bout, bout, nothing. But if we say about, 关于那个 about, about, ab, ab, hear it? Ab, you know, about. Everybody try about and then about. Try. About. Feel your throat. About. About. There you go. You should have voicing even before the, uh, before the stop is released. So about. The voicing starts at the vowel about eating your voicing. During the closure of the stop, we already have voicing. Okay? So that's why context is so important. For the voice stops, it's voiced. I'm not saying they should not be classified as voiced. It's voiced. But in actual speech, if they're the beginning of an utterance, we don't hear the voicing. We don't use the voicing. It's an allophone. It's an allophone. It should be voiced, but we've stopped voicing it. We stopped, I don't know, 100 years ago? I don't know when we stopped. But we just don't. But if there is a voice sound before these voice stops, then we will voice it. About, not your voicing, your hui lai lo. OK? Next paragraph, bottom of 57. We want to teach you to become a phonetician by learning to listen very carefully. That is the whole point. Really, that's the whole point. It's not to teach you my dialect or to Memorize a lot of theory, although if you want to be a scholar, it will be useful to you. The real purpose of this is the same as Ying Ting. We want to make you sensitive listeners. So you can hear these differences yourself. And once you have the training, you don't need the book so much. You can hear everything. Your ear will tell you exactly what's happening. Before, your ear did not know what to listen for. What you should attend to. Is that right? the place of articulation. But now you will pay attention and now you will hear it. Before, it was kind of a muddle for some of you maybe. So the main thing is for you to learn how to be a very sensitive listener. And you should be able to hear them, but you can also see them in acoustic, acoustic waveforms. 3.1 is a record of the words tie and die. So let's look at 3.1 on the next page. I'll describe it while I read. You can look at it. Um, it is quite easy to see the different segments in the sound wave. In the first word, tie, there's a spike indicating the, what does the spike indica indicate? We learned this before when we, um, when we segmented a waveform. When we see a spike in a waveform, it is a, on page 57. If we see a spike, what is it? A burst. It's a burst of noise. And that happens when we release a stop, like That's a spike. I've just produced a spike. So it occurs when the stop closure is released. And then we get a spike or a burst of noise, um, which is followed by a period of very small, semi-random variations during the aspiration. So as long as the air is coming out, 
it's creating a turbulent airflow, so we're getting, we're getting a sound like that. And those are the little wiggles you see at the beginning of the first waveform on page 58. Everyone sees it? 左边先有个burst,一个比较长的,对不对? And then we've got little uh, variations on the waveform. 小小的那个zigzag的形状,有没有? That's the aspiration, that's the air. And then we hit high. And then we get a regular waveform, repeating waveform, which shows us what? It's the vowel, and it's vibrating regularly to show voicing for the vowel. Is that right? So this is our review. In Dai, we still have a burst. Look at the second waveform. We do have a little burst, smaller than with Tai. Why? Because the burst is mainly caused by that burst of air. But with the Dai, Dai, may only a big burst of air. Okay? So we do have a little burst when the stop is released, but we don't have aspiration, so it's a very tiny burst. Okay? Mm. So the major difference between Tai and Dai is the increase in time between the release of the stop and the start of the vowel. This is really important. Now, we're starting on a new topic, but I think you've already learned it. In the tutorial, it's called V what? O T. And what does it mean? Voicing or voice onset. Onset means beginning, kaishi, time. That means when does the voicing start? 就是有声的这一段,发声。发声 is the Chinese for voicing. 发声的这一段从哪一点开始? That's VOT. 我们可以量从那个release of the stop 到那个vowel的开始有多长? That's measuring VOT, voice onset time. If you're having trouble with it, go back to the tutorial because it covers that. So we're talking about voice onset time here. And one thing to put in your notes and remember is this applies to initial stops. Some students in the past confused it with final stops. We don't use VOT to talk about final stops. We talk about unreleased stops or stops that are released and have aspiration, etc. This is for initial stops. That means the first stop of a syllable. Okay, ma? Okay, we're talking about VOT, and it says we'll discuss it more in Chapter 6, but some of you won't be here for Chapter 6, so learn what you can now. Now consider the words in the fourth column. Are the sounds of the stop consonants more like those in Column 1 or Column 2? So look at Column 4, and if you didn't learn this rule, previously learn it now. I've mentioned it in class, but some of you, when I mention it, you don't seem to recognize it. P, T, and K, if they're the first sound of the syllable, they are definitely aspirated. Pi, tai, kai. But if we put an S in front of the P, T, or K, what happens to the P, T, K? Something disappears. The or the? The aspiration is gone. So we say pi, tai, kai, but spy, sty, sky. Here's another thing to pay attention to. Do the P, T, K become voiced? They sound more like B, D, G but they don't sound like voiced BDG. They sound like BDG at the beginning of a sentence, which are voiceless. Boy, oh boy, guy, tie. Oh, no, sorry, not tie. Die at the beginning of a sentence. So if we put an S in front of PTK, PTK are no longer aspirated, but they are not voiced. Put it in your notes, because every year people mix this up. They say, oh, they're like BDG, so they're voiced. No, they are not voiced. They are simply unaspirated. Everybody got that in your notes? Please don't be confused by it. They are not voiced. We just got rid of the aspiration. And we didn't do it on purpose. It just happens. All right, column three. What's, what are those examples of? Those are examples where we voice the voice stops. A by, a die, a sky. Uh, sorry. A, a, a. That's a mistake. OK, let's fix it. It should be what? Page 57, column three. A by, a die, a, the third word should be? Look at page 57, the table, 3.1. The third item should be a, guy, g, y, change it, it's wrong. That's another onion, the 
When you see these, mark them, and then we will tell Professor Johnson so he can fix it in the next edition. So this should be guy. The next column is spice dice guy. We've already explained that. You can see that in column five, we're going to talk about stops that occur where. We've been talking about what kinds of stops? Initial stops, right? Sizhou is stops. But now we're going to talk about where do they occur? Column five on page 57. Look at column five. Where are the stops now? They're final. That's right. That means they're at the end of a syllable. Okay. All right. You can read paragraph the second paragraph on 58 yourself. And we're going to do, we're going to do a waveform assignment. But because you have to prepare for the test on chapter two, I won't give it to you today. Because it's not any shin sama. We're going to use new software. We used WASP last time, which is really wonderful because it's so simple. It's easy to use, right? Open the package and you can use it. Prot takes a little more learning because it's got many, many, many features. And lots of phoneticians now, when they present papers, do their research, they use Prat. Prat is the Dutch word for speak. The infinitive is P-R-A-T-E and Prat, it means to speak. So if you want to, you can just download Prat, have it ready. I'm going to mail you tutorials on how to use Prat. I don't want to overwhelm you right now, but I want you to know that we will be doing this after the test. And we're going to do some shoshu, some surgery. So we will have the words pai tai kai, bai dai gai, and then spy sty sky. And we're going to cut off the S's and then see if the waveform sounds and looks more like pai tai kai or bai dai gai. And you probably already know the answer, but we're going to do that with the waveform with software. So you will be able to produce it yourself and prove it to yourself. So we have finished to the second paragraph of 60. We can mark that. We we'll start on the third paragraph. Who was the last person to read? Karen, was it you? You were the last reader. So you start next time on the third paragraph on page 60. And the test will be on Monday, sorry, yeah, on next Monday, first hour. Does anybody have any last questions you want to ask? Any questions? Any questions? If you do have questions, where can you ask? NTU Phonetics on Facebook. So please, as you're going through the material, and remember, we're going to cover the tutorials. We're going to cover um, parts on romanization. There will be pinyin transcription. There will be another dictation. That's why we didn't do it today, because we're going to have it on Monday. It takes too much time. It will be all of the material from 1 through 2, but we'll concentrate on the material in chapter 2. Okay, and any of the web pages that were assigned are also within the um, fine way of the, of the test. Any questions? All right, maybe they'll come up later. Please post them. Be very da fang with your questions, like Stanley, right? Stanley is very, a very active participant. So, yi you All right, we will see you on Monday then. <laughs>